This is the one that was done correctly and was simply missed. Look at that. That ascending aorta is out of round, as my old attending used to say. It's not a perfect circle. You can see a crescentic density on the anterior right aspect of the aortic root, which almost certainly represents an intramural hematoma. And in addition, there is a flap lower down that looks to be crossing the left coronary origin right around there. So this is definitely a call that could be made. And the thing I want to point out about this is this was one of the best radiologists that has ever worked for VRAD. She was on our QA committee. And look at that MMR, career MMR of 0 0.18. There is only one other radiologist at VRAD who has a career MMR that's lower than that. So uh, this was sad, but you can see, I haven't put the entire report here because this is what it looked like. It's another one of those that just goes on and on and on, dancing around that finding without just putting it together and saying aortic dissection. It says everything but. And there's the impression, which is just a repetition of the same thing that was in the findings. So this got a nine out of 10, except dinged for hedging. This patient came in at 6 p.m., chest pain and hypotension. The CT was interpreted as an aneurysm with periaortic fluid and wall irregularity, and the results were called. The patient was transferred to the ICU for consultation and potentially surgery. The final read the next day described the penetrating ulcer and the mural hematoma, and so, called the surgery team and told them to go right to that consultation. They got there to find the patient dead. So uh, one of the residents from Utah said, come on, found the patient dead? Wasn't, wasn't he in the ICU? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I believe they arrived during a code most likely. Uh, but in any case, this, uh, this patient you know, went that critical few hours without diagnosis. So the estimated verdict was 800,000, chance of success 50, a portion liability 40, and an estimated settlement of 500,000. And that's global. Uh, so we actually uh, got out of this a little more expensive than we had thought, but still not, not a terrible payout at 250,000. So I thought this was interesting, an interesting comment. The radiologist is matter of fact and professional. She does not come across as warm and fuzzy. And in the hours that I spent with her in preparing for her deposition and during and after her deposition, I did not see her smile. I mean, it's kind of hard to blame her. I don't see that there was a lot to smile about myself. Uh, so historically, St. Louis County is a, a conservative venue. The judge did not give them concern. We had, Tax documents that show the plaintiff's business was operating at a loss, and the expert will testify that the radiologist report was sufficient to indicate a need for surgery, because there was obviously a lot in there, uh, but it just was not straightforward enough and did not really just ultimately deliver on that cognitive integration step of a precise diagnosis. Interestingly, uh, one of the referrings there, it says uh, she was subject to impeachment due to the due to the suspicious timing of her notes. And that's something that came up uh, in this case and only one other, where a radiologist clearly received notice of a claim and went and tried to addend his report thereafter. Uh, they don't seem to, those sorts of things strike me as verging on jailable offenses, and they don't seem to factor in quite as much as you might think, but it's certainly something you want to avoid. All right, so those were our aortic dissections. So some ischemic bowel cases now. So uh, the way these broke down was this first one is a, mal a gut malrotation in a three-year-old. Then there was a trauma with vascular injury and subsequent ischemia of the colon. There were two thromboembolic SMA occlusions. And there were two cases that were bariatric surgery complications, right? So, uh, the lesson I take from this, uh, well, I guess two. First of all, look at the superior mesenteric artery in every single abdomen pelvis study, period. Uh, it's got to be part of your search pattern. And it may not pay off 
as frequently as many of your other checkpoints on your search pattern, but it's got to be there. The other thing I will tell you I learned from this is if you see a bariatric patient, a patient with bariatric surgery, get oral and IV contrast, and you are not done until you do. Right? Oral and IV contrast on any evaluation of a bariatric surgery patient. That is my, I call every time, I will not give a, a definitive clearance right, to any study that falls into that category. So this is a great case. Uh, you can see the superior mesenteric artery and vein just snuff out there right, on both the axial and the coronal. And you can also follow the duodenum and watch it take a kink right there. And it's going now backward and in the wrong direction. Right? So it does not cross the midline. You don't have a normally positioned third portion of the duodenum. And on the coronals, you can actually see it encircling the superior mesenteric artery and vein. In addition, the bowel is pretty clearly abnormal, right? but uh, not specifically so, but it's all dilated and somewhat edematous. And uh, this, this is another one of those reports that wanders a bit, right? Diffusely dilated loops of small and large bowel, moderate distension of the rectum, portions of the sigmoid colon are decompressed. I mean, it's just this precise description, but uh, again, all notes, no music. Right, so that was the prelim. What happened, and our, our radiologist did call it in and say, gosh, I'm not really sure, but I think something's going on with the bowel. So we dinged him for hedging. This patient came in at 6 p.m., severe abdominal pain and, and vomiting. At 4 p.m., oh, sorry, got the CT. I think those are reversed. He came in at four and then uh, got the CT at six. Sorry about that. Uh, he was transferred to an acclaimed academic medical center, very hoity-toity place where the CT interpretation was actually not materially different. But then the next morning, the local small facility radiologist came in and looked at these and said, oh my God, this is a gut malrotation. He was the one guy that called it. And he called the academic facility and they said, oh, well, surely this man doesn't know better than we do. So they waited until 10 p.m. until they finally operated on this kid. Uh, he had an extensive anorectomy. He's now TPN dependent from the age of three. Can you imagine? And I will tell you the reason that uh, these are so problematic, these ischemic bowel cases, are that the patient frequently doesn't die, but then has extremely costly care for the rest of their life. So the estimated verdict, it was thought to be as high as 12 million, very young patient, chance of success 40, a portion liability 30, and an estimated settlement of 2.5 million. And uh, incredibly, we got off easy with an indemnity of 1.1 million. So the referring contends he ordered the appropriate tests and the plaintiff when the plaintiff presented to the emergency room, not unreasonable. Uh, at this time, it appears the radiologist has a viable defense, they thought, will contend the standard of care did not require a specific diagnosis that the radiologist did at least suggest there was a bowel problem. Uh, the specific diagnosis of volvulus may not have made a difference. I honestly kind of doubt that. I mean, if you say malrotation uh, in this setting, you're going to get results, right? You're going to get action from the clinical teams. All right, this one. This is one of the bariatric patient uh, cases. You can see the bariatric clips there. And we've actually got a double whirl sign. Now, the problem with this case is obviously there's no oral contrast, and there's no IV contrast. So it's, uh, it's incomplete in its assessment as far as I'm concerned. Now, I did look up the whirl sign or the whirlpool sign or the spin sign. It's called a bunch of different things. And that actually is a pretty good predictor for uh, a volvulus or an internal hernia, hernia of some kind. So I was impressed to see that it's up there in the 70s, 80s in terms of its predictive value. 
So I really think it should have been called here. Certainly it should have made this radiologist say, I need oral and IV contrast. So we got a seven out of 10 for that report, did not address the clinical concern. It was full of disclaimers and it made no recommendations, which should have been in this case, IV and oral contrast. So this patient came in with severe abdominal pain and vomiting. The scan was interpreted as no evidence of bowel obstruction, was admitted and discharged the next day following a small bowel follow through. Three days later came back with necrotic bowel requiring excision, long hospitalization. The patient now has short gut and is TPN dependent. Five to 10 million was the estimated verdict. Chance of success 40, apportioned liability. There are a lot of defendants there so to share the, share the burden. And the estimated settlement they thought would come in probably around 750,000, but uh, we paid a large indemnity of 1.375 million. Again, uh, these patients require very expensive care for the rest of their lives. So look at those uh, those swirls again, though. It's it's worth noting. You can see the bowel takes a loop right there. And then we have the SMA and SMV turning around one another. There's even a little density in the SMA in spite of the fact that this is a non-contrast scan. So this is one of the sleaze comments. Uh, the lawyer was concerned that uh, the radiologist was a devout Muslim who would be wearing a headscarf and thought that that might prejudice people. Uh, and as you can see, it was in Florida. Uh, the discharge summary was cut and pasted for other records, which will help convey the impression the hospitalist really didn't do much of an analysis on the patient. I thought that interesting, because that's certainly something that goes on a lot. Uh, the referring was evasive overall and did not make a great appearance as a witness. The plaintiff has gone through a significant ordeal, but there is something a bit odd about her. And then there's a comment about the patient's husband also being odd how that factors in i don't know so this guy wins my award for sleaze commentary definitely jeez all right so the next one this is another ischemic bowel post bariatric patient this one fortunately had the iv contrast and oral contrast and right there you can see the smv snuff out and the sma snuff out all right and uh well, that's a, actually a, an Ed Calloway rule as well. Always look at the SMV. It's the thinner walled, lower pressure vessel. If the, SM, if, if the vessels are compromised, the SMV is gonna be the first one to go, All right? So here it goes, goodbye. And now the SMA poof, also vanishes. Now look at that cicatrization, that kind of stellate gathering of the bowel loops lower down. There's a lot of mesenteric and uh, intraperitoneal fluid as well. That bowel just looks entirely unhealthy. And we have a similar situation as with many of these cases where the report just kind of wanders about, uh, always on the periphery of the diagnosis, but never directly stating it. Clinical correlation, continued imaging follow-up is recommended, it says at the end of the impression. Uh, certainly recommending a follow-up can help. I didn't see any specific instances where it seemed to. Recommending clinical correlation does nothing whatsoever for your case. So this one got dinged for uh, hedging as well and for the failure to use structured reporting. Patient came in at 5 p.m. with abdominal pain. At 8 p.m., the CT was interpreted as dilated thick-walled bowel. The patient was admitted and developed hypotension, and the final read was correct, but only came when the patient was in surgery. So this is the one, uh, they said the gut was just black, and that certainly is believable. It, it really does look pretty bad on the CT. So extensive excision was performed, and an initial claim of six to 13 million was made. The estimated verdict was brought in at five, chance of success 60 to 70. I thought we actually had a fairly good chance and there were a lot of people involved, so we had a low apportioned liability. Uh, the estimated settlement was thought to be four to 500,000, but ultimately 
uh, we did not get off so easily as that. And we paid an indemnity of $2 million. And I thought this, this is the comment, I read this and think, what an idiot. Of critical importance is the fact that ra the radiologist was not aware there was a history of bariatric surgery as it was not noted in the online rec requisition. I mean, there, there are surgical staples there clearly showing that a bariatric surgery had been performed. That is not a stance I would recommend anybody take, and I think this lawyer had some pretty bad advice. Uh, the other problem with this one is the surgeon had been a defendant in many prior malpractice actions and probably locally had quite a reputation as uh, probably an incompetent. So I think in large part, uh, that surgeon's reputation probably dragged us down and accounts for that large indemnity.